So it's been a while since I've done one of these. This is um, a brilliant menopause conversation that we've got lined up for you today. I am delighted to welcome my guest today, Catherine Neenan. Hello, Catherine. Hi, Amanda. Thank you for having me. Oh, no, you're very welcome. So let me tell you a little bit about Catherine. Catherine reached out to me um, wanting to share her story about a menopausal symptom that occurs in perimenopause that very few people are really talking about but in terms of prevalence a lot of people are experiencing so um, with Catherine's help today we're going to talk about the symptom of flooding and that terminology relates to menstrual bleeding but not just once a month this is a phenomenon that can take place during perimenopause as the hormones start to fluctuate and obviously we have three hormones progesterone estrogen and testosterone and I would like Catherine to tell us um, and inform us which she does so brilliantly by the way it's such a wonderful thing to share these stories because our hope is that it might just make you think is that what's happening to me is that what's happening to people around me and to just be more informed so Catherine welcome um, tell us a little bit about yourself if you don't mind and how you arrived at this experience um so I am it doesn't matter about my age I'm 47 um I was kind of scared in, when we got hit COVID because I was overweight and I had loads of issues so I took it on to do have a gastric bypass which has been amazing for my health um but it has kind of kickstarted me into menopause at, towards the end of July 2021. And in March 2022, I started, as you were saying, flooding. Um, so I had a break for so many months. It was brilliant. Um, but then um, in the middle of March, unfortunately, I started flooding, um, which I knew nothing about uh, at all. It was the most scariest time of my life. Um, so basically what's happened is I started having a normal period and then about three or four days in I was walking down the stairs and this got to the bottom stairs and I was destroyed so I had to run back upstairs again but I knew nothing about it I just thought it was normal and when you say destroyed what do you what do you mean by that can you describe to us what had happened so basically um, I would have been wearing a sanitary towel and the next thing was that it all caved in so my whole trousers down my leg the whole thing and I was destroyed. So basically that happened, ran upstairs, didn't know anything about it. So that was fine. So this is a bit odd. So it happened again the next day. Um, my husband said, look, go up to the pharmacy because I couldn't get with my GP. So I did. And he informed me it's called flooding. And he said that you have to kind of watch it because you can get anemic and to call your doctor, which I did. And he subscribed, uh, prescribed some meds, which are supposed to reduce the flooding and kind of start the clotting. But the problem was by the, that stage, I was flooding two and three times a day. So what I was explained was the flooding is basically what you would have norm, in a normal cycle each month. I was having in 10 seconds. And I was having that a few times a day. Plus I was still having my normal period. <laughs> so I was still a bit of both. So. What happened then was I got another drug added to my one that's supposed to prevent it, but I had the clots. But the clots were actually, as I said to somebody, I'd rather have the flooding than the clots because they were awful because it was just not a nice thing to have because um, I'm an 11 year old boy and I was afraid he'd come into the bathroom and wonder what was going on. So you're flushing three and four times a day. So what happened was my GP said to come in because um, he was getting very worried that I could get anemic and all of those. So I walked in on the Tuesday and I walked into him and I told him I could hear my heart beating in my head and my vision was blurred. So I ended up collapsing in the surgery and fainting. So then what happened next was that um, an ambulance was called and my blood sugars were down to 2.3 and my blood pressure kept plummeting. At one stage, it was 84 over 46 and kept decreasing. And then I started having these awful shakes and um, my nerve endings were doing it. So the practice nurse told my husband that my body was trying to cope and was shutting down in certain sections because my hemoglobin had gone down to 7.8. So I had to go into the hospital, have um, a blood transfusion 
and a few other bits and pieces and had sent home with more meds and was told by the public sector that I would hear from the consultant in two and a half weeks. We're now nearly a year and I still haven't heard from the public. Um, so I didn't know about flooding then um, and I wanted everybody to know because I had no clue. Um, it was just it was just like it was just crazy because this was happening three and four times a day would have this awful whoosh that no matter what I was wearing, as somebody said, you nearly needed to get like granny na nappies or the big, huge ones you get when you're pregnant. Um, and even they weren't containing it. Um, and I am a guide leader and I was standing in, as I was saying to you, a couple of people, I was standing in front of children and parents and I could feel this happening. And I was petrified that I was, there would be a pool on the ground. You know what I mean? I was never so grateful for leather seats in the sitting room in my dining room, in my car, because it can wash. But it was just, a, it was a horrible experience, but it didn't stop just there, unfortunately. Um, I came off the meds the hospital gave me on the Wednesday night and on Thursday, on Friday at lunchtime, I started flooding again. Um, so that's how quick the tablets, do you know what I mean? Once you came off them, how quick it had kept happening. Um, and at that stage, I had still had a clue. So my GP contact, rang him, he got me back on the meds, contacted somebody privately, um, and they saw me pretty quick. Um, but what he does is he always starts swimming on the coil first to try and stop it. So I was on the coil and the meds um, to stop the bleeding. And the coil, unfortunately, didn't suit me at all at all. Um, I had very bad side effects. So that had to come out. So the only option was to have a hysterectomy. Um, so what they decided was with the hysterectomy that they would leave my ovaries because I'm so prone to adjustments in hormone levels that was safer. Um, so unfortunately, I inadvertently caught COVID off my husband. <laughs> Um, so they had to postpone my date, which was awful because they had to increase my levels of the drug, drug to stop the bleeding. Um, so I, I was kind of a bit all over the place, uh, mentally, everything else. Um, but in between all that, my hemoglobin was being watched continuously. Um, and I was still only tittering around the tens and dropping down. And then my ferritin was going down as well which is your reserve iron was going down too so I ended up having the hysterectomy in August and um, they removed my uh, womb but uh, what you call it I had again it's up and down and whatever else like that you don't know what's going on and um, so I have been blessed that I have an amazing practice nurse and GP where I live and they have been my gods sent they have supported me so much and um, they're watching me like a hawk um, so I'm kind of on um, HRT and progesterone has been introduced and progesterone has been a lifesaver for mentality. And I'm also doing, um, been watched for my iron because my hemoglobin has gone back up. My ferritin is extremely, extremely low. I mean, firstly, can I just say thank you so much for talking so openly about obviously something so incredibly traumatic. Um, and it's so wonderful for you to share because I know you desperately don't want other people to go no. to go through this so may we may we just backtrack a little bit and if I can ask you some some questions which is that um do you know what normal is in terms of your iron levels do you know what my, you should be aiming my, for yeah well my normal hemoglobin iron is anywhere between 12 and 13 but my ferritin should be between 24 and 28 and I got my blood results back last week and I'm 6.8 yeah. And so this is the thing that we need people to understand, don't we? Whether you're yeah. having menstrual bleeding regularly, like clockwork, it's really important to keep an eye on your iron stores. Absolutely. Because it's very difficult to up your iron stores. In fact, you can't do it quickly. It, it, it takes it's quite a long, long old process. And so really thinking about what you're eating, supplementing. Um, we know there was we were talking, weren't we, on Friday about, yes. um, you know, some great alternatives. There's something called Ferrograd C, which you can get yes. from your pharmacy, which is a great way of 
it's it's iron and vitamin C, a great way of bolstering those supplies. But let's go back a little bit then. Yeah. So um, let's tell people what's actually causing flooding, because we t- we talked about this, didn't we? And you had an additional complexity. Do you want to tell people what your yes. additional complexity was if this wasn't complex enough? So I uh, I was actually double walled, which I knew nothing about. Um, so basically, my uterus was double walled. So that in itself was quite a surprise. So I asked um, one of the consultants, what does that mean? And she said to me, well, have you got kids? And I said, yes. And she goes, well, you shouldn't have had. And I went, okay, right. Um, I have two kids. But she said that normally um, you cannot retain or have kids if if you're double walled. Um, and what I've looked at is there's one in 20,000 that are double walled. It's a genetic. It happens in the womb when you're being born. There's nothing, there's nothing to be done. You're, you're just born that way. Um, so that in itself was something new that I learned. And I only learned that out due to this process. Yeah, absolutely. And so we talked a little bit about it when we we met last week. And so just for Mm -hmm. people watching this, just to sort of describe. okay, so your your uterus, to all intents and purposes, is this sort of shape. And this is the upper part. And this is where if a embryo is going to embed, it's going to be up here somewhere. But in someone like Catherine and one of those 20,000, her uterus is actually shaped more like this which means that there is two almost uteruses and they work independently. Mm. So when we think we're having a menstrual bleed, we might be forgiven for thinking, okay, it's the blood coming down from both those sides. It isn't. This side might go first. This side might go sometime later. And that's why, it, 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 you know, Catherine really is a miracle to have had two children because just structurally, anatomically, this shape is not so, um, let's say, enticing for a fertilized embryo. It's much harder for it to embed in the wall because of the varying shape to it. And and so this is something we need to make people aware of anyway, isn't it? Outside of the whole flooding thing, there is an awareness piece about um, should we be scanning people more in their reproductive years to find out, you know, is that part of the the infertility issues or reduced fertility issues so there's something there in itself but um but coming back to this then I mean it's not just about flooding it's about having a radical hysterectomy as well yeah you know how much I mean when you think about your time at work how much did your employer know about what you were going through in those early stages um in an early I, I'm I suppose I'm a devil I'm quite open and honest um so I would have said most of what was going on um and my husband would say i'm probably too honest uh, about what's quite like what, what goes on um like as he as he said he's he's a bit older than me and as he said himself he said the day he was leaving me in the hospital when i was taken in in the ambulance he said we turned on the radio they were talking about menopause when he went home to watch something they were talking about menopause he said he just couldn't get away from it so I would be telling all of my female friends exactly what, what, what not just goes down to the double wall, but about flooding yeah. because they're all in around the same age. And I certainly did not want anybody because I left it go too long. I was 22 days. I ne- should never have left it that. So I want women to know, please don't. You're really damaging yourself internally and everything that it's, it's quite scary. It's quite the unknown. Um, I was just blessed that I was in the GP surgery when I fainted, that I wasn't at home and that we were still doing hybrid mode in work. So I wasn't in the office on my own, that I was actually very lucky that I was in my sur- the GP surgery when this occurred. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's the thing. I have lots of women, Catherine, that speak to me saying I'm terrified of going into the office. I'm terrified that this thing which could just turn up at any moment and and women have shown me the bags that they take I mean we were saying weren't we like when you yeah. have children I mean it's the rucksack it's the bags it, there's multiple bags you almost go back to that time of having to prepare to that level for yourself sanitary pads spare clothes but towels I have so many women say to mm. me that they only wear black 
yeah. because they're terrified of a, a show of blood. I have had another person very kindly share that she was presenting when she had a flood, flooding episode to her senior leadership team. So we can see that of all the menopause symptoms, and there are more than 50, this is one we need to be talking about more. I know we talk about hot flashes and stuff, don't yeah. we? But but it's like this is almost the one that we don't know about. So shall we between us tell people why it's happening? Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, because we talked a bit about this, didn't we? Which is so, yeah. as Catherine said, she was already sort of experiencing perimenopausal symptoms anyway. And the first hormone to go erratic is actually your progesterone, which is that pregnancy hormone, if you like. And progesterone is responsible for, if we use this as a metaphor for, for Catherine's u- double uterus, it holds the period blood here in the top of your uterus. It holds it there. And that's what progesterone does. It keeps it there. It's a bit like scaffolding. That's the only sort of thing I could sort of think to describe. It just holds it nicely in place. But as your progesterone levels become erratic, that's a bit like removing some of that scaffolding. It's like this now becomes unsafe, unpredictable. But all the time, because your estrogen, even though that's declining, even though that's slightly at higher levels than your progesterone, we keep laying down more and more menstrual blood until one day, the scaffolding just gives way because there's not enough there to hold it up and then because it's just come away it can't stop it can't stem the bleeding because you've just got more estrogen laying down more blood and that's why often women will be given something called methanamic acid um that can be something that's prescribed that wasn't the case in Catherine's case I think we've gone too far beyond that um and and so it's really important that people understand clots in menstrual bleeding um, can be bigger than this okay and that clotting would signal to you that you are getting a lot of estrogen laden blood being laid down but if it's coming away in clots that means it's been there for a while like anything if you cut yourself it's been there for a while so the clots are an indication that maybe you've gone three or four months without a menstrual bleed but that blood has just been holding there so so in terms of your anemia, so, I mean, can you tell us about some of the symptoms that come with that that extreme blood loss and then obviously the symptoms? Yeah, yeah. so um, very lightheaded is huge. And the one that used to freak me out and freak a lot of people out is that when you go to sit up, whether you're sitting at a table or a couch and you get the whoa moment, that is quite disheartening you know what I mean um the exhaustion oh my god the exhaustion is just horrific um and you'd be laughing as like as I said to somebody I went to Hoover the downstairs the, the, the living room the hall the kitchen and whatever I had to lie down for an hour and a half I was so tired um and also that affects your mentality your well-being your headspace Um, I would be a very people person and I found it very difficult to leave the house with everything. And um, between, never mind the flooding, but just being so low, I didn't want to go anywhere. If you'd asked me to go to the to go to a bank or to lodge money, it would take me two hours to psych myself up to leave the house to do it. Um, and that was difficult because it's not me. Um, you know, I would be very much out, get out, do stuff. And I, fe- I think that I found that hardest. And I think my family found that the hardest that I just wasn't me I wasn't what I was normal you know what I mean and that was yeah. that was difficult never mind the hormones and that has a plays a part too with it and um, it was just it's not it's not nice and I suppose the anemia is the one that my GP is more concerned about the practice nurse are more concerned about than the hormones um, and yeah, because absolutely because that, that's that how going to control yeah that's carrying your oxygen to your cells that's why iron is so important in Mm. that hemoglobin it's what carries that oxygen to to all our cells and and how old would your children have been at that time because let's not forget you're also a mum so how old were your children at that time Um, so my son is now 11 um, and my daughter's 23 but that also explains why it took me so long to get pregnant in between (laughs) It's so fascinating, isn't it? And and it does sort of drive that whole question about what more could we be doing to help mm. in women's health? 
you know, across that whole life course, you know, because we have a very intense period where people are trying to get us on contraception and all sorts of things. There's this massive gap. And then as soon as you've had children, it's like, get you back on contraception. And then we're sort of left in this wilderness. Mm. Um, and no one seems to want to be that engaged with um, our perimenopause, menopause and postmenopause indeed. So, so you're absolutely right. So that exhaustion, that tiredness, and that's you just trying to do day to day functions. I mean, how did that, I mean, were you at work during this time? No, no. I, I in between April till December, I was in and out. Um, I was back for a couple of days in April after being rushed into hospital, and then I was back in July until I had the hysterectomy in August. But I'm only back since uh, after Christmas, um, and that was unfortunate. Which I didn't know about is that you still can bleed even if you have your uterus removed. So I didn't know that myself. So when I woke up, I was quite surprised and I was told I could still be bleeding and I still bled till October. So even knowing that, which I didn't know, I was kind of like, oh no, 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 no. I was hoping my iron would go back up. I was hoping everything would sort itself out. So it was just, it was just, it's it's, it's just a roller coaster. It just keeps going and going and going. And so what reasonable adjustments, have you had any reasonable adjustments made for you at work? Or yes, I was very lucky. I had a phased return, which was great. Um, so I'm still doing hybrid and I'm um, phased return, which was brilliant. Because mentally, even if you've had a pregnancy, you're going back to work after having a baby, you know yourself with the mammy brain and foggy brain, you still have that. Um, but anemia, along with the hormones gone, it, it's double whammy. So if I used to laugh at people, if I, that was one of them too, but I used to write down things to do. And at home, I had a to-do list, remember to do this, remember to do that. And that was just doing stuff in the house. So trying to remember how to log onto a computer, how to do this, how to do, oh, it was just, it was, it, that was exhausting. Yeah, exactly. So was it about seven months then you were away from work? Yeah, on and off, yeah. It was It was yeah, really phenomenal. It was, it, and I suppose what I didn't say earlier on is that when I was in going to see the consultant privately, um, I was being scanned as well. What they usually do just to make sure everything's OK and things like that. Um, she was very nice. And she told me um, that she was seeing one woman a week um, presenting the last two and a half years with flooding. And as she said to me herself, which she was right about because I was the same, that women are petrified to leave the house because they don't want you know to flood anywhere and it's so debilitating that they can't do it and it's just even to come to see somebody privately to know there is options and there's certain options that are great there's other options that you know will and won't work but that's actually quite scary that anybody from the age of 42 to 49 was presenting once a week so it's becoming more prevalent but nobody's huge, talking about it. huge no absolutely and 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 that's where I was at I mean I had an uh, I started my perimenopause journey at 36 and I had a two-year-old and I used to bleed every 17 days for eight days which is crazy I was just, I was like, I, I couldn't leave the house. I didn't leave the house. Um, like you, I'm incredibly sociable, but I definitely lost sight of myself. Um, it was very convenient to stay at home. So I just stayed at home with my daughter. And I think I got really down during that time. And like you say, really anemic. I would bend down and then I'd hear this like buzzing in my ears um, and just like really quite disorientated. Um but that's the thing. You only have to have a couple of cycles where that's going on and you're already on the back foot with your iron levels. And we just don't get enough from our diet, do we, to no. supplement? No, because I was told to eat, you know, eat red meat, eat loads of greens. There's only so much greens you can eat and so <laughs> much red meat you can eat. Yeah. And you can, we just haven't got enough time to be eating for that long. It's just ridiculous. And especially because you've had a gastric bypass as well. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. so 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 it, it, it's, all, it's all of those things, isn't it? And so yeah. it is really important. Like you said, I, I really liked that great advice that you said, which is just not to leave it. No, I like I, I as I said, like as myself and my husband said, look, go up to ask the farm. I went up to the pharmacist because I needed to get bigger sanitary towels. And I just asked, could I speak to somebody? And he was he was amazing he was so lovely brought me into a room told me what was going on and he said look it is normal but we you do kind of need to watch it just a case in round you know when you hit the if you're going to two to three weeks you need to watch it depending on how bad it is um, and he said to me look get onto your gp there is a drug that should stop stop it or contain it that didn't work um, and my gp is an older man 
but he is spot on. Like he introduced something else. Um, as I said to somebody else, I was saying it to a friend of mine, he said, he turned around and he said to me when I'm back in, when I started to flood again, he goes, you need it out. He goes, you're gone past it. You don't want any more kids. You need it out. It's just causing you trouble. And it was right. Um, but I know some people have had ablations and I had that done. But my consultant told me that I had a troublesome uterus. So it's got nothing to do with the bypass. This was going to happen anyway. Um, I think with the bypass, I was an awful lot healthier um, in myself um, that I was able to do this and get on with it. Um, an awful lot better than I probably would have had, wouldn't have been able to if I had been overweight and everything else, you know. Um, so well, that's what I'm saying. My GP is amazing and the practice nurse was with me as well when um, when all this occurred. Um, so I have been given out to by the GP and the nurse and the receptionist in my surgery because I left it too long and I also yeah. shouldn't have done what I did. I frightened them all. Well, we only know what we know, yeah. don't we? We're not we're not taught about these things. And again, no. therein lies a, another need, doesn't it, to educate mm. girls, women, men um, exactly. about about what's happening here. I mean, I think most people who've had a child know that you will pass lots of clots, and that's what I likened it to. It was like just having that all the time. Yeah, um, I, I, as I somebody said to me, it was that on speed, and I said yes, it was. Yeah. And if we say to people, I mean, for those that aren't too squeamish, it just looks like pieces of liver. It looks, yeah. you know, it's very dark. It's formed. Um, or sometimes when you see like little sea anemones at the beach, it's that sort of jelly like red burgundy color to the cloth. Yes. Um, and it's and it's that. And it's just like there is nothing that's going to stop that coming through. No. And it's literally like if you think about it, it's like flushing the toilet three and four times just to get it to and you're kind of going, please, please, nobody walk in. You know, it's no, just no, no. And in fact, actually, I was at a site recently and I did see that someone had put on the door saying that there was uh, blood spattered all up the inside of the bowl. And that and I instantly thought, I wonder if that was someone flooding. I yeah. wonder if that was someone who'd experienced that and just in that very traumatic way that you you know it's very alarming for you the individual um you know and, and people not realizing that there's residue still left so I think we we need mm. to be much much more aware and and like you said the fact that it left it, it led to a radical hysterectomy which then meant there was a significant period of recovery time which you're still going through yes. you know some would argue that you haven't fully recovered from that and that and that actually that's why it's really important that you do take that time to look after yourself um it can be frustrating because you want to do more quickly that that I I I as I said to a female friend of mine I said I thought this was just going to cure everything I thought I was going to be very great I thought I was going to be fine but I wasn't and it took so it's still taking time like I, I think I said to you when we were previously discussing like I've been told my aversion stick is still 6.8 it could take me months years I may never get back up to where I was or where is you're supposed to be and I may be on iron maybe twice a week for the rest of my life I don't know but that's 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 what I have to deal with and they're more concerned about the anemia than the hormones even though I'm on a patch and I'm on progesterone they they're still more concerned about the anemia than the HRT yeah, and everything absolutely else. that's second to it yeah absolutely and right and rightly rightly so I mean as we know even with our hormones that takes a good six to nine months to you know to yeah. settle but your body's clearly in this period of flux and um and so you know obviously thankfully you are well thankfully you got the right treatment that you needed um if you were to give any advice to anybody I mean when you think now about what the signs were what were the early signs that we could say to people to just pay attention to well the early signs for me was that um it's going to sound weird but I was standing doing something with a load of kids and the next thing I went oh my god this doesn't feel right okay where's the bathroom this is not right and I went and I was just again I didn't know it was a whoosh I just said oh here we go and it's back I thought I was you know had finished all this but it's as you said though it's this initial whoosh sound it's literally like someone turned on the top if you get that twice do not hang around go down see your gp see seek help seek help with somebody anybody because it's you don't want to end up being anemic there is medication out there able to help and um, i know some women that have had ablations and it's worked for them and um, unfortunately 
I, it, my consultant didn't do those. It was either a coil or a hysterectomy and that's what worked. But don't leave it go as long as I did in the 22 days, the way I was, because I was very, I was very sick. Um, as one of my friends said to me that when she dropped my son back to me, she said that she saw me the day after from home from hospital and in the last April, she said my eyes were in the back of my head. She said, I looked terrific. Oh, and, and that's the thing that's so worrying, isn't it? You know, because we are keep calm and carry on type yeah. thing isn't it you know and because we're we're mums or or we're just we're working we're, we're doing all that we can when we can we sort of do put ourselves on the back burner when it comes to prioritizing our health and so that is really really fundamentally important one thing that I would like to advocate for people is keep a track of your cycle and yes. and, and uh, monitoring that did you ever do that Catherine did you sort um, of have I, an awareness of how your cycle was going I was I was I was erratic I was anywhere between six to eight weeks and I would have been um six to eight weeks and I would have been about seven days at that stage but I know that um in 2021 after having the the gastric bypass I was I was gone I was gone down to five weeks for about four or five days and then as I said it stopped in July so I assumed that that was because of everything that was going on and then unfortunately I had a couple of blips in November December but they were only for two or three days and it was nothing it literally was in the March and it was literally right bang in the middle of the March I said hello I'm back and I'm back with a vengeance yeah and did you have any counseling around having a hysterectomy no, I didn't, and I probably should have. I did. Tr I did speak to somebody when um, it got postponed because, as I said, I didn't know I had COVID. It was my test was inconclusive before I went into the hospital. But to me, it didn't. It didn't help me because I suppose I'm very much a get up and get on with it and just get it done. Things, you know, happen for a reason. Just muddle along, you know, and sort itself out. Um, I did speak to women that were a similar age to me and they were amazing. Um, they're absolutely fantastic. But again, none of them had flooding. And um, I'm on Facebook with, um, I'm in Ireland with Irish menopause and nobody really talks about flooding. It's all about the hot flushes, tweaking your HRT, other things like that. Um, and I suppose what I wanted for was for people to know about flooding um because I didn't a lot of people didn't um a load of my friends are now telling their female friends that are in the ages of 40 upwards you know that this is something that's out there um and Absolutely. that's what I wanted most out of this is for people to know that it's there it does happen and um, seek help quicker than I did um I do know one of my friends her sister had it and she went publicly and she was six months six months doing having like flooding every every now and then I just went I don't know how that poor woman lived um because I couldn't no and that's something really important too which you've just reminded me of which is that um for those of you that may have had COVID or know people that have had COVID we do know that there is a link between um COVID either the virus itself or vaccination that it can actually cause um fluctuations for people during their menstrual cycle and um, they can get an earlier menstrual cycle they can get a heavier menstrual cycle we know that the covid virus actually attacks ace receptor sites and our ovaries are full of ace receptor sites as our lungs are and so some women are presenting with symptoms of what they think are long covid but in fact, those are early perimenopausal symptoms. Um, so I would say if you have noticed anything as a result of either having COVID or your COVID vaccination, that would be a reason to present yourself at the doctor and to ask for further investigation, um, particularly if you've noticed your menstrual bleeding has changed um, somewhat. I myself react terribly every time I have a COVID vaccination it doesn't stop me having it but um the last time I had it I had a really horrendous flooding episode I hadn't had a menstrual bleed for 10 months and then after uh, literally a week after my COVID vaccination I had one so we don't really know I think we need we need a bit more long-term data on that um but the reality is one thing I would say is a word of caution any unexplained bleeding should be investigated um I really would want people to know that and like Catherine said you know you're you owe it to yourself you are not 
um, you know, putting pressure on other people. You're not wasting anyone's time. You need to look after yourself. And actually, like Catherine said, she's she's willing to share her example because things can spiral very quickly, like you, like you said in in your case. So um, yeah, like like literally, I had seen the G Thursday night, and he said, "Look, come back in on Tuesday because I'm just worried about you. You look a bit, you know, not you look a bit white. We come in on the Tuesday to see what your le- iron levels were like." So that was Thursday and I was in with them at half 10 and I I was so like I collapsed. I was just and myself and my friend were taught were laughing on this on the on the Monday night and I said, I wonder how am I in it or am I on the way? Little did I know I was. And I said to my husband, listen, I'm we, if I know you're not working. So if anything goes wrong, will you come and collect me just in case they can't get blood out of my arm in case I faint? So when they rang, he goes, Oh, don't tell me she's after fainting. But little did he know how serious it was My it was just a mess, so thankfully someone mm. with a higher in a higher place was looking after you my mum my late my, my late mum was when I fainted um was when I was going down my mom said to me don't worry you're going to be okay and she was right yeah yeah you're going to be okay and you are going to be okay it's just going to take yeah. time isn't it and so yeah it so, is and, and so you're absolutely right you know taking those supplements boosting your iron back up mm. so, so when we think I mean thank you so much for sharing your story I mean it's absolutely so generous of you and I know this will help so many people and particularly those who are in a workplace who are struggling maybe don't don't know what to say to their line managers I mean what would you advocate someone should say if, if we've got people watching this who are at work not disclosing and all, all the anxiety, do, what should they do? Do? Do, do disclose because if you collapse, they don't know why you've collapsed. If you're if you're if you were as bad as I was and nobody knows the reason why you fainted, that's gonna cause an issue. Like I was quite open and honest because people but people could see that I was sick. They could see the change in my colour on my face, so they knew I wasn't right. Um, and they were asking me, but I genuinely, I'd, I'd even have down in, in, in my hand, I have a note on my, my phone here, um, you know, what my hemoglobin is, what was going on. I had all of that on my phone that would pop up if somebody needed it. Um, you obviously have one colleague that you're very close to in the office. Tell them if you don't want to tell your manager, at least somebody knows yeah. um, what's going on, because that's what you need. You need somebody to know to be there for you. Um, if something happens, if whether you run to the bathroom and you're whatever, you need that. You do honestly need that. Yeah, and that's what I would say. In my role as a workplace menopause consultant, I, I, you're the sort of person I'm looking out for. We, you know, we need locker rooms or lockers. We need places people can store big bags because yeah. you need all the kit, don't you? I mean, you said to me you had two sets of clothes and the big bags yeah. just in case. Yeah, I had I had two pair of black leggings. Um, and I had, which is really weird, and I had underwear, the whole shebang, but I was away with work for that day, and I, two for the day and two for the night. Amazing. And they were like, why is she bringing a big bag down? It's like, seriously. But they hadn't a clue what was going on. No. Um, but I had let one person know just in case. Yeah. But like that, I was paranoid that I was carrying this big, huge bag, which, which I normally wouldn't, but I had everything bar at the kitchen sink of it, like we do when we have a baby. Yeah. And that's, again, what we talk about when we do menopause awareness. And I know your employer is doing menopause awareness, which is wonderful. That's why we need everybody it is a workplace issue. We need everyone to know what that is all about. And actually, if people need to not be on Zoom calls or off camera, yes. working from home when they know they're experiencing flooding or about to. Um, sometimes you do get a sense that it's coming. Sometimes, you, sometimes don't. you don't. You don't. Sometimes you don't. More often you don't, actually. Um, but we need people to have the mechanisms to look after themselves um, without judgment. That's yeah. really, really important. And so, you know, being close to the toilet, you know, having that that sanitary wear, having cha- a place to put a change mm-hmm. of clothes, being able to work from home during those times. These are all parts of the reasonable adjustments that employers can seek to do in consultation with the employee. So it sounds like you are being really well looked after. So, yeah. so the reality is, you know, what what do you, you know, if you were to want one thing in the next decade for women going through this time of life, what would you want for them, Catherine? To know that it's okay to talk, it's it needs to be out there. You people need to be more open and honest with what's going on. Like as I said before to you, that my mom only had no sleep and was only having hot flushes. She's nothing else. So 
this is the one topic that's not discussed because some people find it squeamish or whatever. But we talk about childbirth, we talk, talk about our daughters starting and having menstrual cycles, the whole, the whole shebang. So why not be open and honest? Because society is changing. We're all changing. There's going to be more and more stuff when our kids are going through this. So we need to be open and honest and discussions. More yeah. discussion about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, I didn't ask you this before, but are you happy for people to be in touch with you? Or is there a way absolutely. people can be in yeah, touch no, with you? Ab- absolutely. Like I've said it to all my friends and even there's another friend of mine. Her friend is now going through this, but she was able to tell her, no, go down to your GP now. Go down, go down. Get to get seen, get seen as soon as possible. You don't want to be like Catherine. Get down, get down. And I was delighted that I had helped somebody. And yes. that's all it is. That's all I want people to know is that you can't, don't need to suffer alone. Please reach out to people that they're there to help you. Yeah, absolutely. And that genetic thing that you mentioned is so true. Now, when I think about it, my mum used to go to work and she was a nurse and my mum used to wear an incontinence sheet in her underwear I mean, can you think of anything more degrading or anything more uncomfortable than an incontinence sheet? And she used to fashion this thing because there was just nothing available. Um, You know, and I remember once my mum coming home and she had a beautiful crisp white nurse's uniform and there was a a blood stain on it. You know, it's that whole indignity. You know, we we must be looking after people better. And certainly, you know, that was 25, 30 years ago. You know, we it's different it's different times now we're talking about it and so we really must make it better for people navigating through this midlife natural experience so well Catherine from me to you thank you so much for sharing your story I'm I'm I know that people will want to is there a way that people can be in touch with you directly or or are you you said you're working with Irish menopause are you no I'm not no I just I'm on there with Facebook oh you're just on there with Facebook okay well I mean you, you, you want to reach out through you you can let come on to me there's no problem at all yeah excellent so um i'm going to put this on our youtube channel we're going to put it on linkedin as well and uh, i know this will do some good so for now catherine i mean obviously it might be great to come back and touch base with you at some stage just to see Perfect. just to see how you're going but for now thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us about this really important topic of flooding thank you very much for having me thank you